My name is Liana Shalatek. I'm the Associate Director of the Washington DC Office of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. Um, and um, as a Foundation Associate Director, I focus my work particularly on monitoring the international climate process and working particularly on climate finance, um, existing climate financing instruments and uh, accompanying them. Well, um, women and men um, fill very different roles in societies. Um, they are also, depending on uh, which countries you are in, cultural um, perceptions, misperceptions, and discriminations, resulting discriminations. And with that, um, there is a very differentiated um, capabilities of men and women, for example, to access resources, um, to um, profit from, from education, to have access to finance um, or to uh, participate um, in political decision making. And all of that has impacts um, not only on the well-being of men and women in a very differentiated way, but it also very often results in women being marginalized in societies, being more impoverished, um, having less say um, over their living situation. And all of that is aggravated by climate change. I think it's very important to see that uh, just basically having more women participate is uh, a, an important and necessary step, but it's not enough. Uh, so it's definitely crucial to give women more political participation, to get a more diverse decision-making body, whether that's the parliament, whether that's in, uh, in economic settings, whether that's, for example, in the climate negotiations. So definitely increasing the role of women, the participation of women in those contexts is crucially important. But again, it's a first step, it's a necessary step, but it can't be the end of everything. So, um, uh, which is why I think it's very crucial to not just get stuck on um, the gender balance of uh, constituted bodies, again, whether that's the parliament or whether that's the board of a funding instrument, but actually really look also bringing gender expertise into those bodies. And that gender expertise can be um, expressed by men and women. So I think it's important to balance basically a more diverse decision-making, uh, political uh, participation, with actually bringing gender expertise and awareness of the need um, to look at the needs and the contributions of men and women in their differentiated form uh, more closely. So um, one example. Um, so we know that climate change is not gender neutral. Um, it has very differentiated impacts on men and women. And for this reason, it's very important that financing instruments that actually try and finance and invest in climate action also take the differentiated roles and capabilities of men and women into account. And if you look, for example, um, at an issue like renewable energy, that becomes very clear because since men and women in many uh, societies and developing countries still do very different things, um, their energy needs are very different. And so the renewable energy that they need are very different. So for example, women are very often engaged more in tasks um, that provide services to their communities um, or in small businesses. Their needs um, to access finance is very different from men working, for example, in industrial sectors and, and therefore having a very different approach to energy. And so, for example, a renewable energy policy that only looks at providing energy for industrial production, but doesn't look at what needs do you have in a rural setting for, for example, the small woman agricultural producer, um, uh, is a misguided policy. So in renewable energy, for example, you need locally redistributed renewable energy that addresses energy poverty. The fact that um, close to um, one billion people and the majority of them women still don't have access to electricity. Um, I could give another example, for example, um, on adaptation, uh, where you are dealing with um, uh, already responding to the vulnerabilities that are created by the impacts of climate change. And a good example there is agriculture. 
So if you are just focusing in agriculture on um, basically uh, uh, you know, the production that you might have for export, but are not looking at local food production and the fact that women are local food producers, um, you will have a misguided adaptation um, investment. So you need to ensure that, for example, local women farmers have access to extension services, which they usually don't have, agricultural extension services, that they get access to small credits that have longer maturities and lower interest rates. Again, women usually don't get access to those, and that would be a really important um, way of differentiating, for example, by using financing instruments between the, uh, the needs of men and women in, in agricultural adaptation. So um, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is the international process and the body that actually deals with the international climate negotiations, has been um, meeting you know, in international um, uh, climate conferences for close to 20 years. But it was actually only in the last um, roughly around six to eight years that uh, gender and the gender impacts of climate change became a little bit more um, actually into the awareness of the negotiators. I wouldn't say it has risen to the top of the agenda, but at least made an appearance on the agenda. Literally, it's only since 2012 that the climate negotiations actually look at gender at every climate conference. Um, so um, we had um, a couple, a multi-year gender uh, program, um, gender and climate uh, uh, change program in the UNFCCC, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And as a result of that, at the last year's conference in Bonn, we now um, established a gender action plan in uh, the Framework Convention. And uh, the interesting part about the gender action plan is that it actually really tries to think about ways to incorporate gender into all of the various sections um, that the climate negotiations um, uh, are going on. Meaning not just in adaptation, where it's you know, very clear for a lot of people or in capacity building, but also in the areas of mitigation, in the areas of finance, in the areas of technology, where again, looking at the differentiated cap capabilities of men and women is crucially important. The Gender Action Plan has now gotten a little bit of money. They should have gotten a lot more, but that means that the Secretariat of the Convention has actually the ability to reach out to the parties, to the country delegations, and help them, for example, in um, figuring out the importance of raising gender differentiated data, or in uh, promoting the idea that country delegations should really include more women than they um, currently do. And that, for example, uh, the leadership of a particular thematic body within the convention should also be um, equally represented by men and women. And so I think it's a very important step. It's a two or three year, uh, I think a two year action plan, so it's not very long but it um, will create accountability. It creates accountability in the system for gender results, and that's why it's very important. 